Well, it is now 1030, and that means it's time for Brainstorming the Human Connection, brought to you by the South Dakota Humanities Council. And my name is Lawrence Diggs. I will be your host and sometimes accused of being the inquisitor, asking all kinds of questions and trying to get people to uh, uh, reveal secrets, you know. Um, this is, however, a an interactive program. That means that we look forward to your questions, uh, comments, uh, discussions, back and forth, because it's a two. It has a number of reasons that that's beneficial. One, uh, it's a much more interesting conversation when lots of people have an opportunity to contribute, because we have more more eyeballs on the subject. But maybe almost as important. It provides us a platform and an opportunity to uh, practice engaging in meaningful, safe conversations, you know, where we can all learn something and not feel that conversations are by nature adversarial. Um, and even if they are adversarial, we can we can still be nice, you know. So this is an opportunity for people to to uh, all of you, all the people who join us to, to uh, get over the butterflies that you have when you want to ask a question, but will I seem stupid? Yeah, so what? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's a condition of the human human race, <laughs> you know, is we, we don't know, lots of things we don't know. We feel like maybe we have to pretend we do. Here, you don't have to pretend that you know. You can ask questions. You can put out a, maybe an idea or something that you, you had, uh, test it out. And then if uh, people interact with you to say, oh, you know, maybe that's not the best idea. Hey, everybody games, you know, we get another point of view, which today may not seem viable. But if, as we go through life, we may re realize that that thing that you brought up, you know, six weeks, two years ago, you know, that's probably closer to the mark than what we were thinking at that time. So we encourage you <laughs> to um, take a chance, ask a question. We're going to get started today, and <clears throat> we're in a unique position that we, our guest today uh, has documentary evidence of the transition of the landscape, and the land makes culture, even though we, we, we don't think of it in that way, and sometimes culture feeds back on that, but mostly the land makes culture. If you live in a mountain, a mountainous area, you're going to think differently than people who live in a desert that's flat and hot. If you live in a cold, uh, mountainous place, just getting around is going to be uh, more difficult in the mountains. You're probably not going to see, well, a whole bunch of one hump camels anyway, maybe some two hump camels, but you only, you'll see different things. So life, you know, is different. And it's because the geography tells us what we have to do. And today, our guest uh, has actually been looking at old photographs that people took and taking his own photographs. And we're in a unique position today to be talking about how those different photographs inform us about the transition uh, that we've transitions that we've been going through in South Dakota. So my guest today is Paul Horstead, author of many fine books that you will be uh uh, introduced to today. Welcome, Paul. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this. Well, let's start off by giving us a little background about uh, Paul. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna just assume that you haven't been riding on, around on two hump camels, but if you have, <laughs> let us know about that. You no, know. not so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you so much again for having me, and I'm I'm really appreciate everybody tuning in as well. Uh, uh, let's see, where do I start? I live near Custer, South Dakota uh, with my partner of uh, 34 years uh, and wife, uh, Camille Reiner, uh, who designs our books. Uh, we raised our daughter, Anna, here in Custer over the last 25 years. She's off at college now in Minnesota. Um, I was uh, kind of cut my teeth as a photographer back in uh, high school in Brandon, South Dakota, on the other end of the state. So I've had both the flatland and the mountain experience. And uh, Started out in newspapers and uh, ended up at the state tourism department as their photographer. And then I began freelancing uh, over 30 years ago now and uh, did a lot of different kinds of 
of photography, magazines, newspapers, uh, you know, you name weddings, you name it. Uh, but about, uh, well, 25 years ago now, we sort of fell into book publishing and uh, I'd worked with publishers and been published in books, but it was uh, always uh, not quite where I ended, where I wanted to end up with those projects. So we started looking at history here in the Black Hills and uh, and uh, seeing what we could put together, you know, operating out of our, our home, basically in Custer, South Dakota, and see what we could do with that. And and uh, I, I just fell in love with the history here. I'm sure we'll talk about that. But the idea that you could take an old picture and figure out where it was taken and stand in that exact same spot and line up the camera very carefully and then try to replicate that view, except with whatever has changed in the modern world, uh, really appealed to me on a, on a lot of levels that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about. Yes. Now, and that is a very interesting approach to photography. Often when we think of journalism, as in books or newspapers or whatever, we think about the word. But as they say, a picture's worth a thousand words. Tell us a little bit about your approach to capturing not just the angle, but the story in that in, in that scene. Yeah. How do you approach that? I, I started doing this, and I didn't invent this technique. I mean, there's other photographers doing this all over the world, but I kind of brought it, I think, to a, a, a little more in depth uh, here in the Black Hills and around South Dakota now and, and elsewhere. But um, And it, it kind of began for me with pictures that were taken during the, uh, in 1874, as many people are aware, General Custer brought about a thousand troops out here and, uh, you know, on an expedition, and they were exploring the Black Hills, but also sort of looking for gold behind the scenes, which they found, started the gold rush, and, but they had a photographer with them, a guy named William Henry Illingworth, and so he took the first pictures ever made in the Black Hills, and so that was my first uh, experience doing this kind of thing, like I say, about 20, almost 25 years ago now. And, uh, and and I revisited those sites just a couple of years ago for an update we did. And 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 it, what was interesting to me, I worked with a, my co-author, Ernest Graffy, uh, Ernie Graffy, good guy and an uh, excellent uh, writer and author. Uh, we collaborated on that first book we did together. Um, and, and what I found that was uh, illuminating for me was that he was working with diaries and journals and uh, we have official reports and we got some, uh, you know, some uh, letters and that sort of thing, all firsthand accounts of what happened on the expedition. And I had the pictures over here and I, we knew what date a lot of the pictures were taken, like say July 26th, they're coming down the Castle Creek Valley up by Deerfield Lake where the lake is today. And meanwhile, Ernie over here has found diaries, journals, newspaper stories that are writing about what happened that day on July 26th. So you have almost a long caption of what you're seeing in the picture. Here comes the wagon train down this valley. Uh, you know, okay, great. We've got a picture of a wagon train, but we don't know anything else about it. But you go over here and look at these diaries and journals and it's it's illuminated by the descriptions of the men who are talking about the wagon train was stalled because we got stuck in a big mud bog. and. Uh, you know, we were uh, admiring the beauty of the Black Hills as we sat there on our horses and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so tying those two things together really became a big part of that story for us, uh, being able to illuminate what's in the pictures from the written uh, testimony, you might say, from that era. But, uh, yeah. You know, what you're saying reminds me uh, that we are currently making history. And because you said that yeah. they, those guys took the time to write something down, somebody took the time and even planned to take photographs. They could have just gone out, you know, roasted their hot dogs, <laughs> and and then uh, and then went home. But they actually, uh, you know, took the time to describe from their point of view, and that has to be always added in the mix. You what was going on? What was their experience? What what was someone else's experience? And the degree to which they could share that with us, you know, it's not the whole story, but it's a little piece, right? That you know that that we can use, Absolutely. along with a with, with your pictures and other people's stories that they may not have even known, that helps us to make that make a better picture of what was going on. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, all of those pieces are important to tell them what happened, and uh, yeah, we want to recognize there's a native point of view. We don't necessarily have that in our book because it wasn't written about at the time in our written sources, but we're starting to rely more on, you know, some of that oral history and and uh, those voices in the modern world looking back at that time. And so it's a it's an ongoing conversation that whole, I'm talking specifically about our book on the, on the Black Hills expedition of 1874 that we're uh, continuing to have today about what that meant for 
you know, still means today what what happened that in that in that era. And I think we can't uh, we can't overlook the information we get just from the the uh, geography and the geology of the place, what we're taking pictures of. You know, if you as I was looking at some of your pictures, you know, and you look at the old pictures, then you look at the new ones that you've taken and notice how some of the ridges, for example, on the mountains have have shifted a little bit or you, you know where, where you know where there's vegetation where either there and not there now or wasn't right. there but you know and then yes. yeah all of those kinds of things and of course the human intervention of building or not building right. in the spot um you know it's, it's not exactly a time lapse but uh it, it's something you know i mean we we get there's data in those in those um, images, when you are taking pictures, um, what are what are what are your priorities in terms of getting clear documentation? I mean, are are you looking for people in the shots? Are you looking for uh, color? Are you looking for what? Are, what are you looking for? Yeah, I'm looking. I guess I've often said. Uh, for for similarities and change, you know, at the same time. And uh, every time I go looking for a new site, and I'm, I'm trying to do a book right now on the whole state of South Dakota, so I'm going all over the place and little towns and landmarks and so on. And I, it's, it's a little bit like a treasure hunt. I mean, that's what drives me. It's just the joy of getting to the spot, the actual site. And uh, so... What I'm uh, looking for, I guess, is is like I say, what has changed? What has stayed the same? What can we learn about history? Um, are there other things? And one of the reasons I like doing this is I, I can't interpret everything that's going on in both photos. Well, I can to some degree, but there's always people from other disciplines coming in, like you said, geologists looking at these or, or uh, land use um, uh, planners uh, looking at uh, how the forest has changed, for example, here in the Black Hills. Uh, so I always appreciate those conversations. And sometimes they happen after we've published the book. It's like, oh, I saw on page 100, you know, the same yeah. tree in the same spot. You know, that tree is still there today. You know, what does that tell us about how long trees might grow? Or even a dead stump is in the same place in both pictures. It's been sitting there, you know, 150 years or longer. And uh, so I'm always looking for those little triggers, I'll call them, of, of uh, similarity or change or um, uh, but obviously, uh, change is a big one. Uh, you know, uh, humankind, uh, we modify the landscape in, in many, many ways. And um, I'm watching South Dakota turn from a prairie state into more of a forested state. I know when you drive across the state on I-90, it sure doesn't look like it. But there are a lot of places where there's many, many more trees now than there were back in, you know, 1890. And uh, so gradually, it's like you said, it's, a, it's not a time lapse. I wish it was. But you do see this this shift over time. Yes. Um, maybe after a few generations of people doing what you're doing, we can put all those pictures together and make a time. Lapse. Yeah, right. I've got a few. You know, I, I started this 25 years ago and I've got a few sites that I've gone back to. You know, I went then and then I went again more recently. And uh, that's that's been interesting. It's like I've been around long enough now to have my own historic photographs that I took. There you, know. you go. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you can soon be register as a fossil, you know, and then people have to take All care there, of it. Believe me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, one of the other things that I, I thought might uh, be discovered is the different kinds of vegetation, even though the pictures that I saw that you took, you know, the resolution isn't, at least on the, on the video, yeah. model, right. isn't that you, you know, you see the exact leaves. But certain trees grow in a certain way; they have a certain form, and and because of you know, there's only so many kinds of trees in our area, mm -hmm. you can make a, a decent guess sometimes about what kinds of trees that there, there are. Yeah. In addition to the fact that there were trees or no trees, or shrubs right. or no shrubs, yeah. or depending on the time, maybe we'll see a certain kind of flower or even a certain kind of animal that wasn't there before. Did you mm -hmm. notice anything uh, particular like that? Well, in and kind of have to talk about maybe the Black Hills versus out on the plains, I'll say. And in the Black Hills, you know, fire was such a natural part of this environment. And, and that's hard for after 100 years of Smokey the Bear uh, to, to kind of get our heads around. But uh, um, fire was a, 
you know, as important to this ecosystem as, as rain, you know, really. Uh, and uh, so fire would sweep the Black Hills or burn it in small sections over a period of 100 years, perhaps the whole Black Hills would eventually see some kind of fire in almost every area. That's generally speaking, not exactly. But and so you have what you call succession of the forest, you know, and after a fire, the aspen trees usually come up first, they grow real quickly. And and uh, and then gradually the pines kind of creep in and shade them out and take over and you get these mature pine trees or or maybe spruce trees in wetter areas around the north sides of slopes. And you can see this, oh, I'm sorry, and then backing up again, then there theoretically would be another fire and this process would kind of start over again in an idealized, you know, sort of model. It doesn't always happen exactly that way. But, and so you can see that in, some of the photos from 1874, there's clearly been a fire in the last 20 years or less, and you have these huge stands of aspen trees, you know, these are the yellow uh, trees in the fall, you know, that, that will cover an entire hillside. And in black and white from 1874, it kind of looks like there's nothing there, but it's actually a stand of aspen trees. And, and then now it's been taken over, 100 years have gone by, and that's been transformed into pine and we've been suppressing fire here since settlement. We don't want forest fires. So we put those fires out when they start from lightning or man-made causes. And in the past, the natural fires would be caused by lightning, of course, uh, almost every summer. And so we've kind of uh, definitely changed the environment of the forest by suppressing fire, uh, allowed the pine trees to just keep growing. And they, the forest became more dense, much more dense uh, with pine trees than it was in the era of 1874. Now, I have to kind of add one more chapter to that. That was what it was around 2000 when we did our first book, 2002. There were multiple occasions where I would go up to a photo site and I know I'm right on the spot, but all I'm seeing are a bunch of tree trunks, you know, because the trees had grown up and blocked the view. And I see that a lot or had seen that a lot. But then we had a, a mountain pine bark uh, beetle epidemic, uh, mountain pine beetle. And uh, came in and killed millions of trees uh, up until about 2016 or 2017 that was going on. So that kind of thinned out the forest again. And that was that's a natural uh, environmental thing too. The bugs were a natural part of this as well, um, but they had adequate food supply because the trees were so close together and they they came in and just you know swept the Black Hills and cleaned out a lot of areas where there still are surviving trees and there are still places where trees block the view but generally the forest is a little thinner than it used to be. And, and uh, we got to be careful about just judging that there's more trees now. There, there may be a few more trees, but they're smaller. They're not the great big timbers that we had prior to settlement. I'm, it's kind of a long answer, but there's a lot going on that I barely understand, but I get some of this information from my friends in the forestry industry or with the Forest Service. And, and we talk about this kind of thing a lot. They're interested in that comparison so they can see what's happened in the forest. And I would add to that, that a lot of times we look at the big picture, meaning the trees or maybe the shrubs. But one of the things that I found is that all of that starts with those other organisms like lichen and mosses. Yeah. And we actually, and we actually have unique mosses and lichens that are unique to South Dakota and just some parts of South Dakota. Yeah. And and they are the beginning of the coming, you know, the the return of that of the forest. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering if you, if your examinations and and recordings would extend to, you know, the kind of let's say the small things that might go overlooked, but without those things, the trees wouldn't be there. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can pinpoint that sort of thing that precisely on that small, you know, especially on the smaller level. It it does tend to be. You get those once in a while intricate, intimate, I'll say, view of the ground right in front of the camera and how things of, you know, uh, different plants and so on, like you said, uh, it's a little harder to see that uh, uh, as a counterpoint to what's going on in the Black Hills out on the prairie. We're seeing, as I say, uh, you know, a lot of places, 1890, you go to some town site, the photographer took this picture of the town laying there on the hills of, or the rolling hills of the prairie. And now what you see are just, again, that first row of trees in town, you know, that grew up on the edge of town now is kind of blocking that view. And I, I don't know that you get a really good look at the ground level, but uh, again, it may be a cornfield now where it was a prairie. So you get, you know, obviously that's a major small scale change, except it covers a huge area. 
uh, small plants uh, covering a large area. That's that's probably the extent of that sort of thing that I could think of offhand anyway. But this is an interesting, you know, now I'm going to be flipping through the book, looking at every picture <laughs> to see if there's something like that, because there could be that I just haven't thought about, and you're bringing an interesting point to this. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And I would say that that as you go forward, it may be a thing that you want to just take almost like a good uh, pocket macro camera, yeah, <laughs> to, right. You know, to, to yeah. take some uh, pictures of lichen and mosses, yeah. yeah, because they're the ones that break down the the first minerals right. down oh, the small all plants. Yeah, exactly. yeah. They're, I mean, they're they're critical to the return of uh, yeah. the forest, and also after those forest fires that you're talking about, all of those little plants that pop up that support the growth of, of right it changes That's, the environment yep yeah yeah you you yep. can only you can only do so many of those things because you could take a square foot of land and spend yeah. the rest of your life studying that's right, it if you got that's right. and some people do that's what's that's what's amazing exactly yeah. exactly so we can just talk to those people yeah yeah <laughs> well that's what i hope people will come to me and say look i got this out of the book you know I, uh, wildlife patterns or any of those sort of things that i'm not by any means expert on that I hope somebody else might be able to extract from the fact that I've found these two got this old picture and this new picture and what can we learn from that in their discipline that that fascinates me a lot so and they may bring the book and say hey this lichen and moss is now eating up the book that I bought for the book <laughs> that's right <laughs> <laughs> they're known to do that yeah yeah well I'm going to open it up to our esteemed yeah. panel now okay We'll we'll come back. There's lots more to to uh, investigate. Yeah, yeah. It'd be nice if we could look at a if we get a chance to look at a couple of photos. That might say way more than me yakking here too. But uh, when we, one time permits, so okay. Yeah, we will. Uh, Very good. Uh, anyone have questions, comments, experiences, things that you've noticed there? And there are also some questions in the chat, by the way, uh, that are aimed. At uh, at all our all of our PhDs on this panel here right, that good. have been studying all of these things very deeply, and uh, and they might even have some questions to the other PhDs who are studying these kind of things deeply. Um, it would be uh, anyway. Like I said, we're we're looking forward to to your questions. So any anyone, I have one. Go ahead. Um, I was thinking about, uh, I bought up little pieces of property and I was trying to get the borders and I can't remember exactly what I looked it up on, but I wanted to see if this old property, I think the house was built over a hundred years ago, you know, what the parameters and what it was like, how it showed up. And I, I saw this line cut across the field next to it and I, I couldn't find the water that goes into the house. And sure enough, after all these years, the sewer line and stuff, when they put it in originally, would always show up in the ground, the, you know, as either a brown spot, a brown line, or a greener line. Mm. But that, that got me to thinking, I my memory's been terrible lately because of health, but um, I keep thinking, um, with all the satellites we have, and then I remember when Google started coming around with the little car and the camera and they were photographing everybody and I was so busy looking at stuff. Um, are you using um, anything that Google has? And also, I think it was the plot map from the FSA, uh, FSA office that I often look at. Do you use any of these to compare what has gone on with the land, the use of the land? I mean, there's a big deal on when you can't clear a slough, uh, they don't allow you in the wetlands and stuff. And somebody must be keeping track of all that information very carefully because they'll get after you. Do you ever use any of the satellite information or? state information or anything like that? Yes, uh, I sure do. Uh, Google Earth is one of my primary tools as it's gotten better in the last, you know, let's say 10 years. Uh, when we did our, our first book 25 years ago, I mean, the internet barely existed and, and Google Earth wasn't around. So we were kind of uh, doing a lot of that on, you know, just by foot and looking, you know, on the ground. And once uh, Google Earth became more widely available and easy to access, and as the imagery got better, um, I, I use that a lot. Uh, and, and you mentioned other maps and other sources and government agencies. And as more and more of that comes online, sometimes you'll 
you know, it's like, oh my gosh, look, now there's a map of, you know, of whatever, the Black Hills from 1920 that I didn't know about before. Uh, sometimes that be, is useful, but uh, just using Google Earth and the increasing quality of the imagery, and there's a, as you may know, there's a slider on our timeline. You can look back in time at like, say, 1985, you know, not that long ago to most of to a lot of us, but to others it is, and and see you know, say how the town of Deadwood, its shape changed because they added a neighborhood or something, you know, got developed uh, here or there or a mine expanded, perhaps. So, um, yeah, I do use that a lot. Um, I'll just elaborate slightly more. Right now, as I look around South Dakota, I have pictures of historic photos of little towns. You know, I'll, I'll talk about the one my dad's from, Bryant, South Dakota. And so I've got a photo of a bank building on Main Street, and I've, I've been to Bryant many times, but it's been a few years, so I'll get on Google Earth, I'll, I'll fly over there, I'll, like you said, down to street level, look around downtown and say, oh, there's that building, you know, so now I know I could go there and the building that's in my old postcard would be there, and then I could, you know, possibly do an interesting shot comparing then and now, uh, as opposed to maybe another town where, everything is gone. As we know, some small towns have disappeared completely. And that might be interesting in itself, but at least I kind of have an idea where I'm going without actually driving there. So I put that into a GPS and I'm driving down the highway and I, okay, I got to go to Bryant and I need to go right to this spot. And here's that building. And it really is a time saver. I can do that kind of research during the winter months. Uh, and then when I'm trying to get a lot of work done in the field in the summer, that'll really speed things up. So yeah, and there's all these patterns of use on the land, like you said, pipelines and wells and, and former building sites, if they haven't been just, you know, obliterated by uh, whatever else has come along, where you can just, uh, it's a it's a deep rabbit hole, I'll call it that. I call those rabbit holes, you know, you end up in them for a while looking at something that's just caught your eye and really interesting. And then you come back out and look for, go back to what you were supposed to be doing for an hour. But uh, um it's a very useful tool of Google Earth being free, you know, uh, it, it, it's a tool that I, I do use a lot. Hope that, hope that answers your question more or less. Uh, that's, that's my primary tool for researching in the field from my home. I had one more question about the forestry department. Okay. Um, did they, since there's so much disease and, and loss of forestry, how often do they record? I'm assuming they have their own way of recording just for themselves, for the Black Gills. About they, recording, recording what? I like aerial recordings. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. You know, they'll show when disease moves across. Yeah, the yeah. No, they definitely were doing, yeah, aerial surveys as this uh, pine beetle, you know, broke out about 2006 and it tended to spread in little patches and waves, not unlike a forest fire, except kind of in slow motion. So they were definitely doing aerial surveys then. Uh, they have some maps. I think you can find them online where you can see the density of the forest 20 years ago and what it looks like now. And it's starting to grow back again. Of course, that's a natural cycle. But but uh, right now they're doing a, what's called a LIDAR survey. And I don't know much about this except what I've read in the paper, but that's where they're using a laser to shoot you know, multiple laser beams as they fly over the forest. And that's supposed to build like a 3D model of the forest and really give them really accurate information on density of the forest and age of the trees and how many trees there actually are there because right now they do that by I assume a human being looking at two photos and kind of saying well this is a thousand trees here and this is two thousand you know we're kind of making estimates but this lidar is a is yet another way to image the the, the landscape and uh, and and get more accurate information and there's quite a debate out here right now about whether we need more logging or less logging and you know, do we want to keep the sawmills open or do we, you know, want to preserve the forest or what, what, what's the best path forward and it gets mired down in politics and so on. But uh, um, information and science is what we need to get those answers in my view. And, and uh, so I'm glad they're doing this, this LIDAR survey. I think that'll be a really good piece of information to have. John, you look like you're ready to, to rumble. Did you have a question? <laughs> Well, uh, yes. I, hey, John. Hi, Paul. I've known Paul for uh, quite a number of years. Ran into him the first time back up in uh, Fort Abraham Lincoln on one of our uh, cluster ride expeditions. Uh, one question I have, uh, Paul, is: um, uh, are, are you doing? Uh, do you have any thoughts about um, revisiting crossing the plains with cluster? Oh, okay. Thanks. Uh, not right at this moment, but maybe down the road. Uh, 
Uh, John's asking about, I, I'm going to just wave up two books here. This is the first book we did 25 years ago, and we just just republished it last June and updated all the pictures and all the text and everything. So, it, you know, this has been out a long time, but we have a brand new edition. And I think you're referring to the fact that we updated this. And are we going to then update the companion volume, which is called Crossing the Plains with Custer? And as John knows, expedition, Custer's expedition came down from Fort Lincoln to the Black Hills. And that's about 300 miles away from, from where I'm sitting here in the Black Hills. And mm -hmm. so this book is about their travels to and from the Black Hills on the plains, where the other book is focused on the Black Hills part of their journey. And uh, Crossing the Plains with Custer is a little different book than the one in the Black Hills, just because there's so much private land outside the hills. So we had to be a little more circumspect about, you know, navigating people onto private property. We don't do that. We just kind of, you can drive by on a highway and kind of see over here where where the route of the wagon train was or where a picture was taken or that sort of thing. And uh, so uh, most of that's still pretty current, although I wouldn't mind revisiting that in the future. And it might be it might be a few years. I mean, uh, you know, as things change and if you're aware of, of uh, any information or major, you know, changes or something we might've missed in that earlier book, uh, I, I should just back up for a minute and say one of the things we do in our books, we love collaborating with our readers, as I think John knows, and we've had people help us find photo sites. We've had them show us wagon ruts we didn't know about. There were old timers back 20 years ago that were telling us about the remains of bridges they could see in the Black Hills here that were built when Custer was here. Uh, we really need that oral history for, or you know knowledge from people who know who are out there and can share that with us. So. John, if you uh, if you've got any ideas in that regard, we could you know talk about it now or or you know in the near future uh, one on one because uh, uh, I always am looking for you know giving out the most accurate information we can and and perhaps an update will come to that book you know down the road a little ways here. I don't have anything uh, immediately in front of me, uh, Paul, but I've got a couple of ideas I'll share okay. with you later. All right, great, um, and uh, I I appreciate. Uh, uh, the time with you this morning, and I will offer this once again. If you need any assistant help, you know, uh, heavy lifting or whatever, thank um, you. Call me. Uh, I'm going to call to help. I think you're in. Are you in? Are you in Rapid? Is that right, John? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, um, I will call you. Like, if not later today. No, okay. I'm just I'm only half kidding because uh, we're having the 150th uh, commemoration of this expedition is this summer. Uh, it'll be 150 years since Custer's wagons, you know, were here, and uh, the historical society here in town is going to commemorate that event. We're having an event east of Custer during Gold Discovery Days, right on the campsite where Custer camped on private land. We've got permission from the landowner, and uh, it'll be right there where they were set up uh, and discovered gold. And so there's a lot of history there. Uh, and uh, just a one day, one afternoon thing, uh, opportunity to be out there and we're, you know, um, there might be some, a role for you to play there. If you want to come out, uh, that'd be awesome. Okay. All right. Or Let's... anyone else who's listening, anybody, everybody's invited again. It's during Gold Discovery Days. Our event is on July 21st. That's a July 21st is a Sunday afternoon uh, during Gold Discovery Days uh, in, in the Black Hills, uh, in Custer, I should say. Yeah. Right. Great. Is... Thank when, you. When... When is the chili cook off? That's where you'll get a lot. Oh of yeah, no, that's <laughs> that's the buffalo roundup. That's in the fall. Oh, yeah, so that's, no, that's, oh, that's down. In, but you don't want to miss that either. Yeah, come out for both of those. <laughs> I don't. We yeah. might have we might have biscuits and hardtack. I don't know if we're gonna and, and beans. I don't know if we'll have. <laughs> bring chili. your own coffee. Bring your own that's coffee right. to soften up the hardtack. That's know. right. Yep. Sherry, did I you have something? One oh. other question. Just a quick question. Uh, as you pick up photos, and you uh, do you have to have permission to print them? And how does that work? Very good question. And I'll try to I'll try to be brief. You know, there's okay. copyright laws in this country, and I certainly respect and honor those because I'm a photographer myself, and I've had my work stolen. You know, before it happens, and especially in the digital age. So. Um, any photo published, I think it's I think it's up to 1928 now. Any photo published before 1928, and I have to say I'm not a lawyer. Do your own research on this, you know, point. <laughs> but but I, you know, uh, but uh, uh, those are free of copyright, which means they're in the public domain and available for anyone to use. Now, if you get the photo from a collection, uh, you know, you may still need to credit the collection that it came from. But if it's your own picture that you bought on eBay or you found in a garage sale. Um, you can use those for almost anything you want. And then after 1928, 
you can do some research on the copyright uh, in the Library of Congress. It's online. And I always check and see, was copyright renewed? It had to be renewed 28 years later. And it's not like I'm trying to get around anything. I just, if there is still a copyright, I will try to reach out to family that's still living or whatever it might be and get, get those permissions or at least get their blessing. And I've done this a couple of times. And usually it's like, oh yeah, you know, grandpa, you know, John, yeah, he took those pictures. Go ahead, use them. You know, it's that kind of thing. They're happy to see them in print again. And, and so uh, usually I haven't had trouble with with that aspect of it. And if you're not printing them into a book, if you're using them for your own use or maybe even sharing with your local historical society, that's called fair use. And you can get away with almost anything there because you're not profiting from it. But I do put them into a book. So I wanna make sure we're doing that correctly. Mm -hmm. Sharon, you were gonna say something? Well, very quickly, going back a little bit, I want to just, are you familiar awesome. with it? I don't think I am. Can, who's the who's the author on that? Boy, I don't know that I do know w. about that book. W. Carter Johnson and okay. Dennis H. Knight, and it's just wonderful. It takes every every kind of the um, Dakota landscape. Yeah, and awesome. That's that's great. Uh, that's probably something I could use for some of my captions at least. You know, so thank you. And the second thing is, um, Custer isn't the most perfect man in the world. No. <laughs> Do you, um, or any of us, I guess, but yeah. Well, I mean, he is a little bit more on the darker side than most of us are in our you know, imperfections. Yep. Um, do you bring that out at all, or do you just- Absolutely. Kind of no, I, I really want to emphasize, we have a book with his title, you know, his name in the title. He was leading this expedition. He's a historical figure. Our town is named after him. I mean, we could get into all of that, of course. And uh, one thing we did, well, in our original book, I mean, it literally says we do not intend to glorify Custer the man. You know, we're 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 more interested in. I mean, this was a historical event. It had a huge effect. You can argue that the Black Hills would be a completely different place right now if they hadn't come here in 1874. The town of Custer wouldn't be here. Gold wouldn't have been discovered, at least not at that time. Things would have played out completely differently. Mm -hmm. um, but having said that, I'm the publisher of these books as well. And, and when we redid that that edition last year, uh, we added 36 pages. And, and uh, several of those pages are, uh, are written by a Lakota uh, scholar named Jace DeCorey, who was the head of Indian Studies program at Black Hills State University for many years. And I reached out to her. I'd heard her speak at a conference, and I just... You know, one thing we didn't have in the original edition was a voice from the Lakota saying, what did this mean to us, you know, as a people, a big chunk of our, you know, our population of our friends and neighbors here. And and so um, I asked her if she would consider writing a, a piece, uh, an introduction, a reflection, we called it in the end, about what the Black Hills uh, mean to her and her people today, what they, what this expedition meant for them back in, you know, the Indian Wars, 1874 period. Uh, which she uh, very graciously uh, did uh, provide us. And uh, um, you know, she passed away a year ago, uh, last November. I mean, like three months after writing this piece. Uh, it's just uh, really sad, but I'm just so um, pleased to, to have that in the book now. So, but we do go ahead then and, you know, we, we quote Custer. We quote, of course, all of the officers who wrote diaries or journals. Um, I'm way more interested in the photographer or the lowest level uh, enlisted man who wrote a diary, you know, that's good stuff. I mean, that's really interesting to me. Um, but uh, yeah, Custer, uh, you know, back then people loved and hated him. Some people loved him, some people hate him. And that's still true today. Um, you know, there are people that think it's a fantastic, you know, what he did, the Civil War, he, you know, played a, I, you have to say a heroic role there, I think. Uh, I'm not an expert on Custer. I haven't written any books about the man or anything or his psychology, but Obviously, he was involved in some of the darker chapters of uh, the Indian Wars period and, and some horrific things that happened, you know, um, and then the Little Bighorn, of course, uh, maybe that was payback, I don't know, but uh, the, pay, the Little Bighorn follows, you know, almost directly on the heels of what happened in 1874. It was pushing the, the tribes into a, a smaller and smaller box and, uh, you know, they had to fight back. So, so we're very sympathetic to that. I, that's all I can say. Uh, that may not sit with some other people. What I'm saying here, I don't know how that sits with everybody. I, that's just my opinion on it. And my co-author, Ernie Graffy, I know shares that with me. And, and uh, uh, that's where we're at as independent publishers of these two books. Uh, that's the position we're, we're taking. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. You had some, you had some pictures 
let's can we can we take a look at yeah. some pictures we'll we'll throw them up on the screen yeah yeah i'll try to yeah. appreciate that i uh i uh provided these earlier and these are just kind of uh yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can get to the first one, I think that is the first one, get that rotated. Thank you. And that's, we're getting there. So I'll try to be really brief. This is about, I'll just say, I think it's 15 or 18 photos. And, you know, um, in interest of time, I'll, I'll zip through these. But if someone wants me to stop and explain, I sure can. I'll just kind of try to, this is like a miniature version of a program I do for groups all over the state at different times. I'm a, as Lawrence is a South Dakota Humanities Council scholar. So these are from the uh, Custer Expedition or the 1874 Black Hills Expedition. That pasture on the right, just hold for a second there, is where we'll have that 150th anniversary this summer, July 21st. Uh, uh, that's right where they camped. You can see their tents on the right. Uh, Black Elk Peak off in the distance there, or Harney Peak as they called it. Uh, and you know, you're right away seeing development here in the Black Hills. A highway goes right through the campsite. There's a campground there. You can literally camp You know where these troopers were camped uh, in a modern campground today. Um, so yeah, go ahead and advance. Uh, this is uh, again from the 1874 expedition, and and these the original photos. And I don't have this on the screen, and I probably should, but in our book they are credited, of course. The original images, these are scans from glass plate negatives that are in the State Historical Society uh, collection in Pierre, South Dakota. They bought the negatives from a collector in the 1920s. An amazing bit of foresight that preserves these images and. So I worked with uh, Kevin Reitzel, the, uh, I'm sorry, Matthew Reitzel, the uh, uh, photo archivist there last, uh, a year ago, uh, to get really super high quality scans of these negatives and the detail in them is just amazing. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for you to read about in the book, but they're really an upgrade and I'm really grateful to the South Dakota State Historical Society for making these available. This is the same tree on the right side. And that's one of the things, again, it's just, striking to uh, to talk about as you look at the photos, one of the several things you can talk about along with the history. Go ahead and advance if you'd like, and I'll try to keep this moving. So we're kind of going through time here. This is 1876, a couple of years after Custer was here. Um, uh, the Gordon Party, as it's often called, built this stockade you see on the left, right where Custer had found gold, right in the same valley. This is on the west edge of Custer State Park, and they've They've reconstructed that stockade on the exact same location. I was trying to kind of demonstrate that by lining up my camera the way the, the photographer did back in 1876. Uh, uh, so, you know, goal accomplished. They built it on the exact same spot. And you go visit that today in Custer State Park. It's a really neat bit of, uh, of living history there. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and this is just so kind of from the project I'm doing right now. Um, I'm going around, as I say, to towns and cities and landmarks and looking for early images not always this early, but this is 1876 Rapid City. And again, the development of towns and cities is something I, I you know, find really interesting. And, and uh, uh, you see how the how the town is spread out there. The Hotel Alex Johnson is there at the left, if you know that building in Rapid City, for example. Um, you get a look at the ecology a little bit with how the how the uh, forest has spread on those hills in the distance. Uh, and, and a little bit of uh, the foreground there for you, Lawrence. So there's a couple of plants there. If you can zero in on what those are, we might be able to sort that out eventually. But uh, um, so this is just a hilltop in the middle of downtown Rapid that did not get developed. You know, there isn't a building in the way. And so um, this really worked out as a, as a beautiful shot, I thought. Go ahead. Um, and this is in uh, Palmer Gulch. Uh, uh, that's Elkhorn Mountain, uh, just west of Mount Rushmore. Um, and I don't know who these guys are on the left. They're just some early explorers. This is probably about 1878 or 1880. Uh, they're out there doing something with a notebook and recording something, but I don't have that information. Uh, and then I just stood in the exact same spot. But this is the kind of the pinnacle of what I try to do is getting my camera in exactly the same location so that the rocks in the foreground, which are pretty close to the camera, are lined up correctly. And that means you got to be within just a couple of inches of the right spot or it doesn't look right at all. So, uh, so, and that's now a campground in that valley there, the KOA campground over there by Mount Rushmore. Go ahead. Uh, Sylvan Lake, a lot of people, uh, including me, you know, just adore Sylvan Lake and, and uh, um, love the history there, that old lodge or hotel, it was called the Sylvan Lake Hotel. It was on the shoreline there, burned down in 1935. Uh, this photo's from probably more like 1895. Uh, but uh, yeah, we still still go there and still enjoy that. And they built, of course, another hotel up on the on the hill above that. So yeah, go ahead. Um, and this is Pactola. 
So, and we all know Lake Pactola, that's none of the lakes in the Black Hills are, are, man, are natural, they're all man-made. And, and uh, so uh, that's what it looked like before there was a lake and then they built the dam. And I was literally walking down the slope and watching that hill in the center in the background kind of setting, so to speak, behind the hills behind it. That's my alignment, you know, I'm trying to, to line up. And uh, so I walked until that pretty well matched up and then I cued the water skier and he came right by and uh, no, there was somebody just zipping around the lake and I just kind of waited for the water skier. But uh, that's from our book, The Black Hills Yesterday and Today, which is uh, another book we did on this on this topic. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, by Deadwood and just kind of showing how these early stage routes, uh, you know, have eventually evolved into, in some cases, four lane highways uh, outside of Deadwood here. Um, and uh, it's just remarkable how much rock and earth we can move to to build a smooth road and uh, kind of disturbing sometimes. That's one of my one of my causes out here in the Black Hills is sort of rampant highway building and, and I call it incremental development as you just gradually sort of uh, modify the landscape until it's sort of unrecognizable. But uh, anyway, that's that's a, that's what this is about here. You can see how highways have come in. This is also in Deadwood. Um, just a really early view of Deadwood. It says toll gate below Deadwood. They actually had a road there that had a toll booth that somebody would collect a fee, to, you know, because they'd spent the time and effort to build a, a decent road. And um, not surprisingly, that's now been replaced by a casino, but uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's what they've got out there in Deadwood. So uh, in a lot of places now. And this is what I was talking about a little bit earlier with Lawrence. Uh, it is a, a threefer here, uh, 2000, or I'm sorry, about 1920 in that top photo. Uh, up in the Needles, up in Custer State Park today. And then in 2005, I was doing this book called The Black Hills Yesterday and Today. And I was using photos taken, you know, at later times. And and that's what I saw then. And those red spots are places where the mountain pine beetle was just starting to attack, you know, in the Black Hills. This is about when that began. And then by 2019, uh, the, the beetle had spread through that area and also, it was logged, so they cut the trees after they died because they wanted to, you know, get the lumber. Um, but what you see left there are spruce trees, which are not susceptible to the same beetle that attacks pine trees. So um, that's real, you know, get in, gets into ecology, but the, the spruce trees survived, but there weren't as many of those. So it, it looks now like it did back in the 1920s. And so to me, this kind of is a, a circle of life kind of thing. Uh, we've seen this whole cycle in some places in the Black Hills, and I now I've lived long enough to actually witness that. But please go ahead. Uh, Badlands National Park. I've I've done a book with 24 national parks, and this is just one of them, Badlands, as well as many others across the West. So if you look really close on the pinnacles on the left, you can see a little bit of erosion. You know, there's been some some changes there. Go ahead. Keep this moving here a little bit. Uh, the largest change anywhere. Um, this is the open cut up in Lead. Um, you know, huge area of Leeds, South Dakota, of course, it was moved or relocated as they went after the gold in the ground beneath. And the landmark here on the right is that little white building was an electrical generating station, which remained even though, you know, the rest of the whole area was, was uh, taken away and mined down into this hole. So uh, this is by far the biggest change I've seen in any one place, uh, you know, in any of the work I've done. Go ahead. And uh, there's just a shot of Deadwood, I'm sorry, of South Dakota, uh, back up, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Helpfully on the caption here, it says looking south from, from 8th Street uh, on Phillips. And that is indeed where this was taken, but it really helped me kind of get to that location. And it's really striking. Sioux Falls, you know, I, I just spent a lot of time there in my youth, especially, and I didn't realize, but I mean, you wish some of those old buildings were still there. And there are a few, but a lot of them have been taken down and replaced by, uh, you know, bank buildings and so on, active maybe as, as we'd like. But uh, uh, there's another one of Sioux Falls. And I I shot this from uh, with a drone because the photographer in 1920 was standing on the roof of the Queen Bee Mill, which burned down in the 1950s. So he's up there about eight stories high. So I flew my drone to that level uh, with permission. I have a license and I got FAA clearance and all that. Uh, and took a photo of Sioux Falls. The problem with Sioux Falls, you have to go back and take another picture about every three months because that skyline is changing so rapidly. But uh, I shot this about a year ago now. So go ahead. I think we're getting. And then just again, uh, I talked about foresting, forestation across the across the prairie. And this is kind of an extreme example. But uh, this was in South Dakota Magazine recently. They call it the Green Glacier. You know, these these uh, cedar and juniper trees are 
in fact, creeping across the prairie, you know, in the lack of fire, there's no fire taking them out like it would have back in the prehistoric pre pre-settlement period. And you can really see that the bridges there have moved around building of the dams, which flooded the river. So there's a lot to unpack in this two in these two photos that we'll try to do in our next book. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, last one, just kind of, again, showing the problem I run into at a lot of photo sites, if it's a problem, that is, there are trees where there weren't in the past, so I kind of have to figure out ways to uh, show that without having it be too boring because all the pictures look like this, but not all of them do. I am looking for elevated aerial views, photos taken from uh, grain elevators, photos from uh, water towers, you know, that sort of thing. A lot of photographers in the early days would climb to get an aerial view, so to speak, uh, and sometimes that works out well. I think that's the last slide. Uh, oh, yeah. that, And I'll just be briefly a plug for the books here. We've done about five of these books using this theme. The upper left one, Black Hills Yesterday and Today, is probably our best-selling one. That's got all kinds of Black Hills photos, about 150 angles, Mount Rushmore, and all kinds of places. And then we did a book on national uh, Camille and I and my daughter Anna went around the country in 24 national parks. And this is all self-funded. This is all done by sales of our books. So we really appreciate, you know, anybody who's ever purchased one of those. And then the two books on Yellow, on uh, Custer's expedition that I've showed. And then at lower right, a book on Yellowstone that we did. And I go out there and do book signings each summer, a, a book just on Yellowstone then and now, which uh, is, is a pretty cool book too, I think. So, yep. Thank you for showing those. And any questions or any whatever you want to go from here, Lawrence, just let me know. Well, I'm going to open it up uh, back to our panel first before we get into our sort of final stretch here. We only got about 10 minutes left. Uh, anybody have questions, comments, things that you've seen, tips that you can give Paul about? Yeah, please. You have some, some unique places? Uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I have a question. Um, I, I have your book, The Black Hills, and I was just looking through Thank you. And a few of the photos, like the one you just showed, where you're standing where the early uh, uh, earlier people were. You have people or a car where a car was previously. And um, I knew a photographer who always said, don't feel that you shouldn't pose things. You know, if, if, if you want to move that leaf, feel free to do that. It makes your picture better. Uh, so my question is uh, how, obviously you don't do it all the time, but how do you decide when to do it? And also um, on the size of the photos, um, sometimes the old photo and the new are more or less the same. Uh, more frequently you have the newer photo be a full page and the, um, the little one, the older one might be a little um, overlay. Yeah. Yeah, good questions. Um, my, you know, uh, you're talking about design and layout of the book, and I might have to uh, defer to my uh, partner Camille, who does that. But we talk about that, of course, a lot. And my my favorite way, probably overall, to present these photos is exactly the same size. You know, so that you have a mirror. That's not a mirror image, but you know what I'm saying. The same exact image side by side, and that's usually what I do in our slide presentations, uh, so that you can very clearly see every corner of the photo. But occasionally, you know, for variety in a book, you might have one be smaller or larger than the other. Maybe there's an interesting detail in the in the new photo or the old photo that we choose to make that larger. So I, I hope that answers that. And as far as uh, posing, you know, or setting up. Uh, I, I I normally just like to walk up to the site and record what's there, but I certainly have been guilty of parking my car where there was a Model A car parked back in 1920, or you know I need to park my car somewhere, so I'm going to put it there. Uh, or uh, uh, oh, I've probably pruned a branch or at least bent a tree branch down because it was like literally poking right into my camera where the photo site was, you know, uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't want to modify what's there, you know, too much, because I want to record, of course, what, what, what I find at these locations. So, uh, but I can't swear I've never, uh, never had any influence on what you're seeing in the new picture uh, in that regard. And occasionally I've had fun. You saw one there where I stood in for the, the guys with the notebook, you know, just because it seemed to be screaming for that sort of thing in that case. And, and that's sort of become a trademark image for me, showing me, you know, working out there at one of those photo sites. So I do use that a little bit, but yeah, thanks. Those are great questions. I hope I answered everything there. Oh, yes. Thank you. You, you bet. You know, one of the things that brings up, though, is in, in one case, the comparison photos as tight as possible offer, you know, a, a brilliant 
uh, platform for investigation. But I would also offer that as long as you're there, being the next uh, like photo a photographer for the next person that comes around 50 years or so, uh, or, you know, to come back and look at that again yeah. and, sh and shoot some things that the other people didn't shoot because yeah. they were using those, you know, uh, large format cameras and, right. and you almost had to go rent a yeah. camera to yeah. take those things around. Uh, and, and you only had so many glass negatives right. and you know what I mean? Now you yeah. have digital. Oh yeah. You can no take problem. A lot, yeah. You can take a lot more pictures and you have better glass Yes, uh, maybe not you know comparable for you know to to the guys who are really in it. Yeah, but you do you do have you know flatter planes and you know all that. You, you, oh, know, yeah. talking, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So so it it yeah. seems like it's also an it, it it can be an opportunity to to add something to sure. the history and discovery. Yeah, I I do often and I shouldn't say often, but I try to remember to do a wide shot, and I'll sometimes spin around and shoot what's outside the frame, you know, especially if it's something kind of interesting. Uh, and I haven't mentioned this, but we, of course, record GPS coordinates for everything. We've been doing that since 2001. Uh, and so that uh, I hope uh, it won't be quite as uh, difficult a search for somebody in the future to to maybe get to these spaces. And, and for our readers as well, a lot of these places are on public land, especially in the Black Hills. So you can self-guide yourself exactly to some of these photo sites that I've just showed you. Uh, if you'd like to do that, especially along the Black Hills Expedition route of 1874, we've got all kinds of information about following that trail uh, in the book and uh, going to the photo sites or going to the campsites or just along their route somewhere. Uh, so trying to make it a little easier for somebody down the down the road to to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyone else? We got about four minutes or less. Anybody else have something they'd like to add, Vicky? A uh, quick question. Have any of the Native Americans um, done anything historical or photographed anything that you know of? Oh, gee, I know there's some history, great history out there by, uh, you know, by Lakota and other uh, tribal authors. Uh, uh, I don't know about photography per se, at least in the way I'm doing it. I know there's all kinds of wonderful photographers out there. Um, so I, I don't know if I can answer that, uh, you know, fully. I was uh, just thinking if yeah. somebody joined you, like oh, a Native yeah. American, right. joined you in publishing and joined you in thought of how the book was prevented, you know, your view and their view. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I mean, I, I, I'd love to have that conversation, that possibility. Uh, um, our, our book, uh, the book that I'm working on right now, which we're calling South Dakota yesterday and today, and probably, you know, we hope to have that out in a couple of years. Uh, I mean, I'm definitely doing some work on the reservations. There's some very early photos of, of uh, uh, the uh, agencies, as they called them back then, like the Rosebud Agency. I just was looking at a picture of that. And, you know, back in 1890, there's some teepees there and a few cabins. And now it's more of like a housing development. It's a really interesting comparison. And I hope to talk at least with people who live there and see what they think about that. I mean, so I, but I, yeah, a more formal collaboration, I, I definitely would, would consider that, you know, I, I'm always looking for another idea uh, about how to, how to move forward with this. So thank you. Welcome. Well, oh, Sharon. There's a wonderful photographer in Macintosh by the name of Frank White Bull. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, we're we're down to about a minute and a half now, so I would like uh, to kind of uh, wrap up with any thoughts you had, and maybe you could, if you have the time, can comment on uh, any architectural changes that you that you have seen, like oh, the way barns were built, yeah. Yeah. churches were built, and that kind of thing. As you're as you are, you just doing landscape. I mean, well, the building, I, you know, I'm, I uh, generally don't. I mean, I could focus on individual buildings. There's all kinds of photos of like the library or the Elks Lodge, you know, in 1890 or whatever. But then I'd be, boy, there'd be thousands of them. So I do tend to do broader views of like Main Street if I'm doing a town or an overview from the water tower. However, you know, I'm, that's a good question because one thing I've noticed that's driven me crazy a couple of times, and there's one right here in downtown Custer that I just discovered last week, you know, uh, 
people back then, they didn't just tear down a building, you know, like we do now. It's in the way we need a new building, tear it down. They would pick up a building and sometimes just rotate it and set it back down again for whatever reason. I don't know. Or move it a block down the street. And there it is. And it's like, well, that was I thought that was that building. And it is that building. But they moved it a block. Uh, there's probably has something to Probably has something to do with feng shui, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we built it in the wrong spot. Uh, yeah, that be. So that's that's one architectural thing. And, and you see other crazy things like a second floor added or uh, back in the 1970s and energy efficiency. Uh, you know, a lot of beautiful old buildings had these big arched windows and those got condensed down to like a little square window now that's much more energy efficient and it's not super attractive all the time but it was definitely saving money and I totally can respect that in your small town South Dakota you need to cut bills and that's how you would do that by saving energy uh, so uh, that's one other architectural thing that it comes to mind um, but uh, yeah moving buildings around was definitely a, a curveball and uh, now I'm kind of watching for that as I look at old pictures because yeah. I think there was quite a bit of that. Yeah. Well, we've come up on our 1130 mark. We want to thank you again, Paul, for thank you. joining us and, and sharing such wonderful information with us and remind uh, everyone that if you uh, can uh, look in the chat, there's two, three little dots. You click on that and you can save the chat to your right. desktop. Just click on the thing that says save and you'll find it someplace, you know, just click thank on you. chat and, and, uh, You'll, you'll be able to uh, go and pick up some of his books. Uh, will you be at the uh, book festival this year? Yes, I will be. I'm speaking at the book festival this fall. They've invited me. I'm really looking forward to that. So maybe we'll connect with some of our viewers here today as well. I, that would be great. 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 Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We'll see you next week, same time, same station. Thanks, Lawrence. Bye. Thank you very much.